you know, everywhere around us, we're inspired by things, aren't we? We're inspired to take it to the next level. Look at this day and age, um, home and garden TV, right? We're inspired to take decorating to another level, gardening to another level, cooking to another level, right? Our careers, education, we're inspired everywhere to take it to the next level. All right, so think about physical exercise. This is where I want to begin. This is the illustration that I'm going to use, and some of this is funny to begin with, so we'll start here. Taking it to the next level <laughs> physically. Okay, here's our first slide. Raise your hand if you've tried this. Oh, seriously? Only three people? Four people? Y'all, in the 70s, when I was in high school, my best friend and I from from high school, her parents had a pass to the European health spa. And so as we toured the spa, we were fascinated by this. Okay, I looked it up online. I can't remember it now. The jiggly, the jiggle, the jiggle belt waist machine, something like that. And we were convinced it worked. And so the little instructor would walk us through the routine, the stops, and she said, if you do this three times a week, and I can't remember how many minutes we did it, but you would strap into the belt, flip a switch, and you could do your waist, and it would jiggle, and your hips, and your thighs, and it was supposed to jiggle off your fat. <laughs> we believed her. And we did it faithfully, and it did not work. <laughs> this is what I would call a low-level of exercise. It was, it's not taking you to the next level. You didn't even have to break a sweat, you know, as you're doing this amazing machine. It, in fact, the jiggle machine made us giggle because it would, your, your, ver, your voice had a vibrato and we would stand next to each other and just jiggle away, but nothing happened. So I would call it a low level of exercise, right? Okay, how about this one, the next slide? The thigh master. Do you remember that one? Raise your hand if you ordered this one. You did? Oh, we've got several in the group. Okay, all right. I tried it once or, it didn't work. Did it work for you, Pam? D did anybody, did you, did it really make a difference in your life? Were you inspired by it? I don't know. To me, this one again was, not, she looks fabulous, but, but she, I didn't go to the next level with this one either. All right, our next slide. Do you remember this? Yeah, I think it's called the gazelle, and I think his name is Tony. Is that right? And look, he's just so perfect, and I never tried this, but I'm not sure that it took anyone to, did anybody order this one? Can I see? All right, no. Oh, one, one person did. That's, do you still have it? Do you still have it? You do? Oh, no, you didn't. You garage sold it. Okay, all right. Or Craig's listed it or whatever. All right, so the gazelle. How about another one? All right. Now this is taking it to the next level. Take note of his red face. I just didn't want you to miss that. Do you know this really is? Don't try this at home. If I tried, I think I'm bigger than Mike, my husband. I think I would crush him or cause a heart attack or something, but... This is definitely taking it to the next level, and they look like they're both doing it, right? How about this one? Would anybody forget this? <laughs> Richard Simmons? Yep. Yep. Boy, he created a movement, didn't he? Literally. And in every way, he created a movement. Absolutely. How could we forget Richard Simmons? So our next slide. Y'all. All right. Olivia Newton-John. I did not know that she had a... A video, exercise video. Did y'all know that? Oh, you did. I remember Jane Fonda. Now, y'all, she has an amazing voice. Look at the, look at her, look at her crew. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a joke, but it's not. Those, those, they, they looked like that on purpose. So I don't know what it's supposed to communicate, but I don't know that I want to do her video. But anyway, then we have one more. <laughs> Even babies take it to the next level. Even babies take it to the next level, don't they? 
you know, I went through a season of my life, and I'm going to use exercise as an illustration. I went through a season of my life where God impressed me and told me, Karen, you're living at a low level of loving. It's like the first slide that we saw, that the guy in the belt, that didn't take much effort, and it didn't take much discipline to do that type of exercise. Well, the kind of loving that I was doing or trying to manifest was, Jesus told me so sweetly, you're living at a low level of loving, and I'm taking you, I'm bringing you up, in building you up, maturing you to live at a higher level of love. And so I asked him about that specifically. I said, Lord, what is that? I know it's your love, but what is that higher level of love? And he made it clear to me that the low level of loving in which I was living was selfish, was self-centered. It was about me and my needs being met or not met. And some of these things I verbalized and much of it I internalized. But he made it clear to me that's not where I want you to live, in the way of love. I'm calling you up, and he's calling all of us up to a higher level of love. And so this is what um, we'll be talking about tonight. I'll use the word love as an acronym, okay? Sometimes that helps me remember a point or two that Jesus is teaching me, and that love is is agape love. So we'll begin with the letter L, okay? That'll be our first letter uh, in representing agape love, the highest form of love. It's noble love. It's godlike love. And the first L would stand for next level. He wants us all to take it to another level because he is the essence of love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that. God is what? Love. It's him. It's his attitude toward us, toward his son. It's his very nature. So to be God-like, to be God-like and to be um, having the attribute and attitude of agape love is his love in us. The next emphasis I would make in the letter L, with the letter L as an acronym, would be, this is a practical way. In fact, I, for, I think I forgot one of my focal, my focal verse. I'm not sure if I forgot that or not. But the, the verse is 1 Timothy 4, 8. And it says this, For bodily exercise profits us a little. And you'll see another version that says, But training in godliness profits us both in this life and in the life to come. Now, it's true. Paul was telling Timothy, there's a backstory to this. Timothy was very aware of the athletic scene in that day. There was no hindrances to those that were professional athletes. It was amazing what they endured and what they would shed in order to be the perfect athlete to attain the perfect body. So Timothy was a pastor of a very large church, and he would watch them. And Paul knew this and knew that he was impressed by the way that they would train in athleticism. And so Paul uses this verse to encourage him and says, Timothy, it's true that that kind of dis discipline will profit you a little. And think about it, girls. Exercise is good for us, right? No doubt. But it's only going to extend our life maybe for just a little bit. True. But Paul is saying, take it to the next level, Timothy. Training in godliness, training in God-likeness, and all that it is will not only profit you right here, right now, in this life, but I promise you there's a reward. It will profit you in the next life to come. There's reward. So Paul is telling him, this young man in the Lord, I don't want you to live with regret, and I don't want you to be entangled by the snares of the world, but I want you to be such a man that you are so laser-focused on maturing in Christ, right? So taking it to the next level, and then also, I'll give you a practical thing that the Lord has taught me along the way that speaks agape love to, to everyone. It's simple to become a better listener, to become a good listener. To listen well means that you love well. Isn't it true? The people that are in your life and in my life that really hear 
you, really listen to you intently, that speaks love. That is a form of agape love. James tells us, he gives us instructions, three instructions for becoming a good listener. He says, be slow, excuse me, be quick to hear. That's where he begins. Be quick to hear. And in the Greek, the word for quick means active listener. You are an active listener. Then that's much different than just hearing something, right? Much different than, oh, I heard you, but you really weren't heard. An active listener is a form of love, agape love. Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak and slow to get angry. It's great instructional words for us in learning what agape looks like. It's just a practical illustration of how we can take it up another level in the way that we love. And some in that point may minister to you today that you want to become better at listening and really focus on people because that speaks agape love. All right, our next letter would be O. And I have two points for the letter O. There are opposites in our life. People that are opposite of us. Opposite is a good thing, right? Opposites complement us. Most likely, if you're married, you're in the room and you're married, you married an opposite. God put you together with an opposite in personality, in gifts, in talents, and it's used to conform us to the likeness of Christ. God uses opposites in our life. Most likely, we're compatible with our opposites, right? You don't always feel this opposition. Sometimes you do. That's normal in human nature. nature. But God knows what he's doing in bringing opposites into our life. It's to shape us like iron sharpens iron. Remember that verse? To make us a better person. And the meaning, the better person is the best per person, which is Jesus Christ. That's the goal, is to be conformed to his image, his likeness. That's God-likeness personified in his son, okay? So opposites are good. Then there are those that are oppositional in your life. This is tough, and this is when Jesus spoke this message to me because I was dealing with some different people consistently that I felt it was oppositional. They were opposing me. And truthfully, one even said, they didn't like me and that I needed to know that there were people that probably weren't going to like me. But this is a good thing. Listen why this is such a good thing. The Lord, when I left and got in the car, this was such an amazing thing. The Lord said, yes, remember my word in Luke, which says, beware if every man speaks well of you. This can be a good thing that there are oppositional, difficult people in your life. So, do, so be encouraged by that. Even though it's hard to deal with difficult people, the oppositional people in your life, it's kind of like good versus gotcha. Does that make sense? There are people in your life, and they kind of play gotcha, meaning, let me give you an example. All right, so you're having a conversation with one of your oppositional people, and you say, oh, I saw so-and-so, and she looks so beautiful in her blue dress. The gotcha person, the oppositional person, is the one who says, it wasn't blue. Well, it was blue, but it also had yellow and purple in her dress too. And you're thinking, for Pete's sake, that's not the point. The point is, do you know? The point is that person looks beautiful and that you didn't feel the need to discuss every single, but you know, on the spectrum of oppositional people, it can be as benign as that you know, but they always, they're the correctors. Does that make sense? They're the correctors and they're constantly correcting you. But this is good because God is using it to shape our lives to be more like Christ. So agape love with your difficult people. All right. So this is, I'm going to spend some time here on this because we're entering the holidays. We've just came out of Thanksgiving. A lot of people that are oppositional, that are in your life, you see them maybe over the holidays, maybe? <laughs> just, just a few, just a few. 
And so you're wondering, how do I relate to these difficult people? They're kind of my irregular person. Now listen, the enemy will use that difficult person in your life to distract you from your direction. Difficult people are brought into our lives from the enemy's perspective to distract us, to get us off from going the direction that God has for us, his ordained plan, his call, his ministry, his way of life for you and for me. And so remember, in the way that we love them, we've got to remember this. They were created in God's image. So we love them because he loves them, our oppositional people, just as much as he loves us. So love, agape love, the highest form of love makes allowances for the ones that are opposite in our life and the ones that are oppositional in our life. As long as we're alive, we're going to be dealing with difficult people. To ask God to remove those people would mean that we would have to be dead. So we don't, we think of it truly, isn't it true? So we don't want to be dead. Not yet. I don't think. Most of us, right? So We've got to learn how to master agape love, that higher level of love. Difficult people will be used to distract you from your direction. So you just got to go into it knowing, wait a minute, God has called me to a higher form of loving. And I want to love the opposites and the oppositional people in my life. And what does that look like? By the way, in the first chapter of Job, when Satan is introduced at the at the throne. Remember, he comes to oppose Job. In the Hebrew, Satan's name in the first chapter of Job is literally translated, translated the opposer, the one who opposes you. I think that is fascinating that that is the Hebrew word for Satan in that first chapter of Job. And boy, did he ever oppose and become a form of opposition to Job's life, a mighty man of God, a righteous man of God, right? So we know that Satan is afraid of us. He's afraid of you. He's afraid of me. He doesn't want us to be on to him because he knows that Christ's kingdom on earth right now is in and through us. It's manifested through our mortal bodies. When we're surrendered to Christ, he is using us to bring his kingdom, which is in heaven, on earth. And so that's why there's so much opposition. It's a spiritual fight. It's a spiritual issue, ultimately. And so if we can just grasp and realize this is really a good thing, even though it hurts, even though it's painful, even though it can be a spectrum of benign to really belittling, betrayal, mocking, making fun of, you know it, don't you? You know, you know the people in your life that do this. And it is wearisome. It is. But God is giving us his supernature, his supernatural power. We can try the love in our nature, in our natural way, but it's limited. But when we ask Jesus to give us his supernatural power, he supernatures us with himself and infuses us with power from himself, that blood-bought power that can help us love those oppositional people in our life. Okay, so here we identified that there are opposites and oppositionals. So here are some things Jesus taught me during this time in dealing with wanting to raise to a higher level of love, right? This. Rick Renner, I came across a line that he said, agape love is not stupid love. I love that. Agape love is not stupid love. God taught me in that, that agape love does have boundaries. You know, you don't want to beat your brains out trying to love people that are constantly coming against you. We are called to love them with that supernatural, supernature love that only God can give. But but we need to have boundaries and a fence of sorts in which, well, let's put it this way. Okay, you and I, we're a vessel, a human vessel. Each and every day, we have a certain capacity of emotional energy. 
to give away. We have a certain capacity of emotional energy. Jesus wants you to be very strategic who you empty yourself for. Does this make sense? He wants you to be very strategic, and he wants you to be high-minded and int intentional in this way of who am I called to love today? Who am I called to sacrificially lay down my life maybe today for a friend, for my spouse, for my children? It's a high level of loving. He wants you to be strategic. Now, the enemy will make sure he'll send an oppositional person in to zap you, to drain you, right, of your emotional energy. And you're spent. And you can't continue to pour out to the people that God has assigned you and assigned me to pour into and to minister to, to disciple or to share Christ with. It'll be a distraction, remember, to affect you and affect your direction. Because if Satan can't have you, and he can't if Christ is in you, he cannot have you. So what does he want? Your direction. Because it's Christ that he hates, and he's afraid of Christ in you. So grab on, hang on to that. Okay, so we have another point in dealing with oppositional people that Jesus taught me. H.D. McCarty has a great line. He says, it's not so much that people are against you. It's just that people are for themselves. Isn't that true? God has brought that line to me so many times. He'll have me stop, step back, and get a perspective. It's not so much, Karen, that they're against you. Because see what's hard for me? I love people. I really love people. I get excited by people and wanting to help people. I truly do. God wired me that way. I don't feel like it's to meet a need. It's just that he put it in me. It's just a gift. I truly love people. So I'll get discouraged by people. Does that make sense? So his line helps me. It resonates. It's not so much that they're against you or you. It's just that they're for themselves. And that is low-level loving. Selfish love, self-centered love. It's got to be about me, for me, and all about me. That's low level. And they may, they may not know any better, but we know better because we've been taught by the Holy Spirit and we're still being taught by the Holy Spirit. Another one that Jesus told me, you know, for the, those that are believers in our lives, and maybe like all of us, they're on that highway, right? Following hard and fast after Christ. And then the world kind of creeps in. Remember Mark 4, 19, for the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. The word becomes unfruitful in a life that takes the wrong exit, right? And so those that are on the highway are trying to encourage those other believers, oh, just get back up on the highway. Well, what God told me one time, you're waiting. You're waiting for these to catch up, to come along with you. You're waiting. So you're stuck. And you know, by the way, the oppositional people in your life are going to cause you, if, if you're not careful, to go the opposite direction. And you certainly don't want to do that, right? So you're waiting for these people to come along and to be where you know they've been, where you know they've walked, and you've seen the fruit of their lives, and you're grieved. At a certain point, God will tell you, and he might, in fact, be telling you tonight, you must go on without. You must go on without. You must go on without that person. You must go on in spite of that circumstance because God has a specific call on your life, on my life, and we can't be held back even though the goodness of our heart because of what Christ has put in us is waiting for someone to come along. So I don't know if that ministers to you tonight to go on without. It might be time to go on without. Okay, so we talked about the opposites in our life, which are good. Oppositional, which is good for us too. It's kind of good, but gotcha. But still, we're going to love them anyway because they were created in God's image. 
we're going to look for these tools in which that we can, can help each other in dealing with difficult people. The next one, a practical application of what I call V vertical um, would be how to pray for them because prayer is one of the highest forms of agape love that you and I can do for someone else. It, much of it is unseen. Much of it is unseen, but it's so necessary, and it speaks love. It speaks love to the Father. He's so impressed that we're trying to love someone by the way that we pray for them. Two verses here that I think of. One is in Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies, right? And pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Agape them. Agape, again, is the noble, highest level of love. To love someone is to do good to them. Knowing it may never come back to you from that person. You're still going to be kind to them. You're still going to do good to them. You're going, agape love wants to give, has a desire to give. So we should be active in doing this in the way that we love our enemy. We must love our enemy this way because Jesus did. And he's the one that's speaking this verse. He's the very one, and he's the one who knows best how to love an enemy, right? The ultimate one that was betrayed, the ultimate one that was cursed and made fun of, mocked. He knows better than any of us will ever know because no one has suffered like him. So he teaches us. He's our best prime example of how to love someone. Continue to do that good thing for them, to give to them. Now, don't beat your brains out and give all your emotional energy to that one soul that continues, right, to come up against you. Give the appropriate amount of time and boundary that God has called you to. All right. So next, the next verse is Luke 6, 28. Luke 6, 28 says, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that mistreat you. Bless those. I love this. Bless those that curse you. I always think of this verse when I think about blessing and cursing. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs. It's Proverbs 18, 21. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You've read that one, right? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, meaning those who are talking about it, whether life-giving words or death-giving words, curse-giving words, there will be a fruit of it, not only in our life, but in others. So when you're raising your children, you want to first give them life-giving words. We need to correct them, absolutely, no doubt. But you want them to know that my mom, my dad, my that primary person in my life is giving me life, giving words. And that's not void of correction. I just want to be clear on that. So life and death are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, those who speak it, whether it's positive or negative, encouraging or tearing down, we're going to eat of its fruit. Not only us, but the ones we're delivering that word to. It's very, very powerful. So vertical, being in constant prayer for others, the ones that God is bringing to your mind. You know, in, in, in this thought or in this train or development of thought of vertical, I think also of 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Now, this is interesting. We could spend a whole separate segment on 1 Corinthians 13. It's all about agape love. It gives us detail after, after detail of the characteristics of what agape love looks like, how agape love acts or becomes. But what I love in verse 7 is in the part of the original language, it translates this way. When it says, believes the best, it means that you believe, you choose to believe the best and highest for other people, whether they're your opposites or oppositional, the ones difficult to love. You choose to believe the best. So what I do and how Jesus started me with baby steps, with the difficult people in my life and going to a higher level of love is this. He would encourage me, just say their name before me. Just start there, Karen. 
just say their name before me. So I did. I took a baby step. It was hard for me to bring up their name because of hurt or past or whatever. You know, you've experienced it. So he said, just say their name before me. That's good enough. Let's start there. And then he would have, then the feelings would start coming along that I would start to have a compassion for them and a pity for them, knowing that they themselves might be in bondage or they themselves may have experienced something in their childhood that's only a direct result of why they hurt. Because hurt people hurt people, right? And so he would give me encouraging words of just call their name before me, but make sure you're praying for them, bless them, and this is a high form of agape love, of loving others. Now, mother and dad, I'm so inspired by their lives, so inspired by their lives. And I can tell you that their prayer lives, I'm, there's, I, I don't know, I don't think, of another, other people that pray like my mom and dad. Dad has a saying, prayer is either everything or it's nothing. Prayer is either everything or it's nothing. P live your life like you believe it's everything. So it's in the backyard, and my mom and dad, as I've said, are prayer warriors. They take prayer seriously. It's not just poetry to them. They will bring your name before the throne. I was in the backyard. Daddy has a tree in the corner that he prays under. So he has this little wooden chair. It's a green wooden chair. It's kind of rickety. You don't even really know how it supports him. So one day he was showing me, hey, look what I added to my prayer tree, under my prayer tree. I said, okay. So he poured a concrete slab that the chair will sit on now instead of the raw ground, right? And then he built this little roof. It's only this big just to keep him, I know, just to keep him, just to keep him dry. Oh, y'all, one morning he was so excited, was it like 5.30 in the morning or so, a fox was sitting on the fence. And he said, Karen, this fox is on the fence listening to my prayer. He said, he said, and then I tried to follow him, and then I couldn't find him. He gets so intrigued by a fox or squirrels or these birds that come by. He's got quite, he's got, you know, it's kind of like a Disney movie when you know that little princess falls, and he's got this little that is so dad. Mother knows this is so true. So there's this little little um, covering so that if it rains, he won't get wet. His head won't get wet. So I worry about him at 4 30, 5 30 morning, picture him in a blanket. I hope he's in a blanket. I've told him to please wrap himself up in a blanket, to please throw the blanket in the dryer before you go out there so you're getting warmth while you sit out there and pray, but keep praying. I love this about my parents. Well, I looked and he added something else. He added a wooden shelf. And inside this wooden shelf, now this is all connected to the fence. So it's like a corner, right, of the yard. And inside the shelf is his Bible. And it's a legal pad. And on the, so I grabbed the legal pad one day. And I looked. And I went, Dad, Paige, you pray for all these people? He said, well, yeah, honey. Yes. I said, Dad, that is awesome. It so inspired me. I went home, dug through the study, got a legal pad, and I said, I'm doing this. I'm going to take this up. I'm going to be inspired to this higher level of love to pray so seriously, so matter of fact, factly, so specifically for people. So I have mine. And the only reason I'm sharing this with you is not to say, oh, look, Karen prays. Or, oh, look, Bill and Addie pray. It's not that. Jesus is telling us in Matthew and Luke, in a hundred other places, pray, people, pray. Pray like you've never prayed before. So I have my legal pad divided up. Those that need salvation, right? Those that need help. I have my oppositional people on that page. <laughs> I, have, I have my difficult people on my help sheet. And then I have healing right? Those that need healing. And then I have a section of just thanksgiving, okay? So you know what? Maybe you'll be inspired by my mom and dad that you'll take up this call, this higher level of love to pray like you've never prayed before. God's watching. 
God's listening. That's the one. That person may never know that you did this for them. Do you know, isn't it true, don't you feel this way? Just suppose, just suppose you passed away and that oppositional person was standing over your grave and they said, well, I didn't really like her that much. She bugged me. Something about her was just off. But I'll tell you this, she loved me. Don't you want to die knowing that that other person or people know and feel they're loved, that they're so loved? Because that's God-likeness, isn't it? That is his attitude. You know, we carry his character. We identify with him. We are identified with him. The world will know him by our love for each other. Won't they? That's what scripture says. So this is agape net love that we're speaking of, that highest form of love. So vertical. One other verse I want to uh, leave you with in V, vertical, in praying for others. Remember, prayer is either everything or what? Nothing. Live like you believe it is everything. Take it to the next level. Romans 5 eight. This is, if you don't hear anything else, make certain you hear this. This is the best news that you're going to ever hear, ever. God demonstrates. God stood up. He showed off his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Agape love is demonstrative love. It's a love that stands up. Was the cross laying on the ground when Jesus died on it? Now, they put him on it, laying down, right? And then they what? Raised it up into the ground. This is very significant because it goes with what God is saying in, in this Romans verse. That God stood up his love. He demonstrated his agapiness, agapeness to us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ gave his life. It's what I call the ugly, beautiful tree. It's ugly because Jesus had to carry all of our sin. He paid the price. He was the perfect atoning sacrifice, making us at one with God. It was ugly. It was brutal. But what made it beautiful was that same man, Jesus Christ. And so that's what makes us beautiful, that those who look to the Lord, those who say yes to the Lord, those that believe in him and believe that this is, by the way, agape love, has a boundary here. And the world doesn't want to hear this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. The world, listen to the media, listen to some preaching. This is, this is troubling to me that we're getting away from biblical truth. There is one way to Father God. One way. There is a boundary, if you will. Not that, not that, I mean, help me, Lord, communicate this, that his love is conditional. His love is for all. He's saying come, but access to him has a boundary. And the boundary is his son. And that there is one way. Jesus said it himself. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come to the father except by through me. So, if you will, agape love has a boundary, even for the Father. He's saying there aren't many ways that we can just take his word and take little pieces of it out. I'll do this part of the word, but I won't do this part of the word. This isn't for today. It's not relevant. This is dangerous that we live in a day and age where the word of God is being cast behind our back. Where the word of God is not, well, thank goodness the word of God is being preached here in this house, in this place. So make sure wherever you belong in your fellowship of worship, make certain that you are getting biblical preaching. Because you want to know that the access to God is narrow and the world doesn't want to hear it. 
and they don't want to believe it, but I want you to hear it. And Jesus wants you to hear it. Don't leave this place until you've said yes to him and him being Jesus, the only access to God. He's waiting for you. I teach a little after school program. It's called Beach Club you know, for kids in the public school. And before Thanksgiving, I had two little girls uh, that wanted to come up and talk to me about Christ. And they said, you know, I, one little girl said, I pray, Mrs. May, but I don't feel like he's in me. I said, okay, well, let's look at it this way. Pretend you're a house and you have a front porch. She said, okay. I said, pretend that you've just kept Jesus on the front porch, but you've never allowed him to come in. Pretend that you've talked to him through the door or through the window, but you've kept him on the porch. He wants to take up residence in your house, in your life. She totally got it. It was the sweetest thing. So when we were praying afterwards, she said, Miss Karen, Jesus said something to me. I said, what did he say? Because I always tell them, now, when you're praying, don't think about Miss Karen. Think about Jesus. Think about talking to him when you're praying, when you're talking to him about him saving you and forgiving you of your sin. She said, Jesus said, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. And I thought, now y'all, you can't make that up. You know, you can't make, you can't possibly make that up. That is the Lord speaking to that little girl, waiting, saying, I'm ready. I'm ready. You just tell me you're ready and I'll be ready to take up residence, to make my home in your heart and for it to come to pass. And it's a sealed deal. I always tell the little ones, now, once you believe on Jesus and choose and commit to following him, he doesn't hop in and out of you. You're going to still continue to sin, but the good news is you're in a state of forgiveness. So he won't hop in and out of you. He or sealed, he will remain in you. So this verse I hope and I pray that the Holy Spirit, and I pray tonight that you'll say yes to the one access. The boundary of agape love here is access. One access to the Father is through Jesus. Now, in closing, with our acronym of love, L-O-V-E, E would represent this, eternal view. Much of what we're talking about right now. It's eternal perspective eternal view. Remember our verse in the very beginning? Remember our guy with the, the first belt and before this bodily exercise? It does profit you a little. It does. But training in godliness will profit you in this life and the life to come. There is a reward. And my encouragement is you don't want to live with regret. You want to live for reward. So how are you loving today that will make a difference a hundred years from now. How are you loving today? Do you know the way in which you love will make a difference? And there are many manifestations of agape love, charitable giving, right? Doing good, being kind, um, whether you receive it or not, or get it in return. But remember, praying for someone, sharing the best news in the world that Jesus loves them, that Jesus came to save them. This, will it make a hundred difference a hundred years from now? Yes. In the way in which you love and share the gospel? Yes. It'll make a difference for all eternity. The way that you love your children, the way that you love your spouse, love your friends, love your family, love your opposites, love your oppositional people, the way that you love them in the highest form of love, of agape love, it will make a difference a hundred years from now. Maybe two years from now, maybe tomorrow, it'll make a difference. But my encouragement is, let's take it to the next level. Let's take love to the next level. Or I will close this out in prayer. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for ordaining this time. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would translate everything that only by your power can you do that to make sense of everything that a human flesh can say or not say and forget to say. It's all about you and for you. It's your words and it's your 
um, purpose in our life. Lord, you know this is the heart of my prayer, that there's, if there's anyone here that has never 